Hi, this is Misha, and we thought it was time to revisit the Italian Carcano. We did a video a little over a year ago, have some different rifles, some of the same, so I thought we'd do a series here. On the table, I've got an early production long infantry rifle. This is a model 1891. Then I have a late production model 9141. This is a so-called short infantry rifle. And just to fill the table out, I brought out the Verly M7087-15. This is exceedingly long. Well, the Carcano story does not actually start with the rifle itself. Rather, it starts with the cartridge. The original Carcano fired a 6.5 millimeter, 6.5 by 52 projectile. And this was developed and introduced, adopted in 1891. Now, prior to this, Italy had been using various versions of the Vetterli, this rifle here. Initially, they would adopt the Model 1870. It was a single-shot version of the original Swiss Vetterli, still firing a 10.4 millimeter black powder round, so a pretty large diameter bullet. But the Italian version, even though it was just single-shot initially, had one important update over the Swiss. It used a center fire cartridge rather than rim fire. Then in 1887, the Vitali update was introduced, is the M70 87, and this would introduce a four round vertical box magazine. But a very short time later, they would begin working on the whole Carcano program. And this was named after. Salvador Carcano, who was the chief technician at the Turin Arsenal, who led the design team to develop it. Well, first off, we have the cartridge itself. This was Italy's first smokeless powder infantry cartridge. And while everyone was going to smokeless powder around 1890, and they were all decreasing their bullet diameters from 11 and 10 millimeters down to usually around 8, sometimes 7.5. Italy was the first to really go small with 6.5, which was honestly a pretty futuristic idea. They also adapted the man liquor in block or clip system, as you see here. The clips would hold six rounds each. But they made one important update. They made these reversible, or, you know, bi-directional. So you can insert them. There's no top, there's no bottom. You can insert them whichever way. This is very important for something in the heat of combat. Also, as you see in my hands, we have some made of brass bronze, and we have some that are blued steel. And they, so they would use different types of clips. So once they had an idea of the cartridge they wanted to use, they worked on the rifle. Now, the Italians had already had a pretty long history of kind of taking elements from already existing rifles and installing them in their own weapons. Therefore, the 1891 Carcano infantry rifle really isn't anything revolutionary for the most part. We have a pretty standard bolt system here with the fixed head, which to be fair is pretty modern for that era. Two lug, straight handle. We do have a pretty good use of a manual safety here and even a decocker as such. It takes tension off so you can decock it and then put your safety back on. Also when the safety is up, it clearly blocks the sights letting you know it's on. So the safety is quite well thought out. This is the in-block system magazine. The trigger is nothing unique or special. It's just a trigger. It's not horrible. It's not great. 
We have a hexagonally cut barrel back here near the chamber. This is a 30.7 inch barrel, so just under 31 inches, so quite long for that day, although it was shorter by two inches than the preceding rifle, so a little bit shorter. The rear sight is quite interesting. We have a fixed peep here for 300 meters and then we have a pretty fancy adjustable sight here when it's all the way down we're at 600 meters and it adjusts up to 2000 meters so obviously that's more of a volley fire and when it's not in use there's a cutout in the stock to fold it into so pretty pretty fancy rear sight as far as it goes we have bottom mounted sling swivels steel butt plate short upper hand guard which is pretty common for that era unlike a lot of other guns made then this is actually held on by the barrel band not little spring clips like on the early infields so that's good have a very standard bayonet lug we have a single piece cleaning rod it's pretty thin and a fixed well it's drift adjustable but a blade front sight no protectors so on and so forth so a pretty conventional rifle. They would design this around the new 6.5 cartridge and it would officially be adopted in March of 1892. In the beginning production would be slow. They still had plenty of Vetterlies and they were getting set up at various places and this was their first smokeless powder and as needs arose they would increase production and decrease production over the years until World War I. Then in 1915, they would ramp up 1891 production and produce these in quite large numbers until 1918. It's difficult to say exactly how many long rifles were made because many were cut down to carbines and of course others were, were destroyed during the war, but over a million. Most came from the Brescia and Turney arsenals but many subcontractors and smaller arsenals were called upon as the need arose. It was actually a very good dependable rifle in the trenches of World War I. It's a very simple gun. It was pretty cost effective for Italy to make. And it, it, really, it really suited Italy well. They were able to have a good rifle with a very modern cartridge for that day. It didn't cost them a boatload of money. Perfectly easy to train troops on. This is an extremely average gun, and I mean that in a very complimentary way. That's not a, a dig at it. It is very good for what it is. It gave Italy a rifle when it needed one, and it served very well. One element that is unique to this in fact, it was so unique at the time they considered it a state secret, a military secret. These rifles would have what we know today as gain twist rifling. That means towards the chamber, the rifling is slower and then it tightens up towards the muzzle. This was thought to help decrease erosion, help with accuracy, help the bullet build up speed. It was just thought to be a better idea. Now as time has gone on, you don't see many modern manufacturers using this method because it is much more complicated and the gains are very small, if any. And there's one major detraction to it that we'll talk about in a different video. But that was one of the few true interesting features that very few, if any, other rifles of the day had. Again, the bolt's just very standard. To disassemble it, all you have to do is pull the trigger and the bolt slides right out the back. See here? And it's pretty easy to disassemble. It's a very simple bolt. There would be a few minor changes over the years with the placement of extractors and, excuse me, of the ejector and such. Minor little tweaks as time would go on. Like I said, this is an early production, still made in the 19th century, but they would pretty much stay the same throughout World War one with of course a little bit more rushed finishing and whatnot 
during the war versus pre-war guns. Many 1891s would remain in service throughout the 1920s and 30s, and they would even do a small production run right before and during the very early days of World War II from about 1937 to 1940. So there was a small little run of these before World War II. And that was pretty much it for this rifle. Now, while they were really getting 1891 production up to speed, they had to field a large number of Vetterleys. For the most part, in the beginning, these were still in 10.4 millimeter, and they were usually the 7087 magazine fed version, although a few single shots were still being used in 1914, 1915. And these would be deployed and still used throughout World War I, but we're shooting a non-standard cartridge for that day, and it is black powder, so on and so forth. So what they did, beginning in late 1915, they reworked these old Vetterleys to fire the new 6.5 by 52 round. It was a pretty in-depth process, but it was still faster, and they still had many of the rifles ready to go. What they would do, they would take the original barrel, I'm going to point this at you guys. They would install a liner, converting it down from 10.4 millimeter to 6.5 mil. Surprisingly, this was actually done very well. You don't really hear of much trouble with the liners. They, they, they tended to be installed correctly. The sights would be pretty much left as is. Cleaning rod's still here. We still have the side mounted bayonet lug. This still takes a Vetterly bayonet, although a good number of the original long bayonets were cut down to be more like an 1891 Carcano bayonet. Most of the other features are st standard back here. What they would do for the bolt, since this was originally a center fire for a rim fire round, they would cut off the bolt head and braze on a new one for the rimless 6.5 round. So the bolt is adjusted there. They would also remove the four-shot box magazine and install a Carcano six-shot mag. And they would have to install little pieces of wood because this mag is more narrow than what was originally here. So they had to kind of uh, modify the stock to take this. What they did not really change was the fact that this bolt, while it has two lugs, they're in the back. This has a very thin stem up here. This was originally meant. This was originally meant for black powder. It will fire 6.5 smokeless. However, it's pretty pretty weak. They did not expect these to see heavy combat. They were mostly made for auxiliary troops, artillery crews, communications, uh, runners, communicate, you know, other types like that. Uh, reserve units, so on and so forth. So they were really a second line type gun, at least that was the original intent. They would keep converting these, mostly using the long rifle, but they would convert some of the Vetterly carbines through 1916 in large numbers and in small numbers through 1918. We don't know how many they converted in total, but it was quite large. Uh, 400,000 to half a million, just as a kind of a rough guesstimate. Now these did actually end up seeing combat, and they gave Italian troops a gun when possibly they would not have had much of anything, or they might have been stuck with the old 10.4 black powder cartridge. So they did give them at least a gun in a modern caliber, and these were a substitute standard much cheaper to convert over for Italy while they were still getting Carcano production up and running. After World War I, most all of these 70, 87, 15 Vetterleys were given away or sold off to Italian allies, usually in Africa. So a lot of these would see use in the 1920s and 30s in Africa and even into World War II. 
not typically by Italians themselves, but by their allied soldiers. So that's where most of these ended their days. And for our final rifle here, as I said, this is the 1891, or just M91, 41 short infantry rifle. Now in episode two and three, we'll talk about the carbines, but just to briefly say now and here, after World War I, the Italian government and the Italian military decided to go away from long rifles and really switch over to mostly issuing carbines. It was felt that a carbine could do everything that was needed because the military is becoming more and more mechanized, Mussolini, so on and so forth. Well, by the late 30s, after experiences in Ethiopia and other combat zones, they quickly decided that, hey, we still need a long infantry rifle. It still has a place on the modern battlefield. There was a prototype series in 1940, which led to this model here, the 9141. And this is just basically an updated and streamlined for mass production 1891. The original had, as I said, a 30.7 inch barrel. This one's a little bit shorter. We're at 27.2. So we're losing about three and a half inches. We still have a long barrel, much longer than a carbine. It's actually uh, about a, a, you know, 10 inches longer. That gives us a longer sight radius. But we're still shaving off several inches, which means less weight, less material, a little better handling gun. Still have a pretty much the same front sight. The rear sight now is a shorter, smaller, more simplified rear. This is actually taken off the original Carcano carbine. We have a 300 meter and then a 600 back here and this goes up to about 1500 meters so a little shorter range otherwise it's the same receiver is the same if you notice now we have a simple round barrel here instead of the more ornate hex you saw this transition in a lot of guns starting in world war ii it, it really is a result of the newer, more updated machines that were being used for manufacturing in the 1930s and 40s versus the ones from the late 19th century. Also, we've simplified the rifling. We're no longer using gain twist. We're just using more conventional rifling, which really saved time and sped up production. Receiver, magazine are the same. We do have dual sling swivels now. We still have the bottom, as you see. We also have side mounts now, so this can be slung in two different ways. Still no trap door in the buttstock, it's just a solid stock as before. And we're still with a straight bolt handle. And we're still firing 6.5 millimeter Carcano. As I said, these were adopted in 1941 and went into full production in 1942 and would be produced until 1944. And they would make over 900,000. So for about a three year, two and a half year, three, three year run, they made quite a few of these. And these would stay in service until being replaced by the M1 Grand and M1 Carbine in the late 40s and early 50s. And this was the last long rifle, or I guess I should say short rifle, short long rifle, how about that guys, <laughs> version of the Carcano. And it's often kind of overlooked today and just lumped in with the original 1891. And it really, it's very, very similar, but it has its own features and it was made at a completely different time. This gun is analogous. The whole situation with these two rifles is very similar to the Mosin-Nagant. You know, you had the original 1891 Mosin-Nagant in Russia, which ha was very long and so on and so forth. And then they would adopt the 18, excuse me, the 9130, which was a little bit shorter and a little faster and cheaper to mass produce. We have the same thing going on here with the Carcanos. We just, they sped up 
production, made a few shortcuts, but still delivered a very good and possibly you might even say more durable and dependable rifle because of the few simplifications. But yeah, this was the last major variant to really be fielded. So I thought we would just share it and bring out the Vetterly because I think these uh, conversions and how they did them is pretty interesting and frankly pretty cool. <laughs> Well, this, as I said, was just part one looking at the infantry rifles. If you have any questions or comments or just want to talk about your own Carcanos, as always, we welcome in the comments below. If you like the video, please click like. This one has a stiff bolt, guys. I need to oil it. Pretty good trigger on this one, though. And if you enjoyed it, Please look for part two and three to come soon on various other variations. This is Misha, and we'll catch you next time.